Yeah, I want to tell you a little story that happened in 1978 uh, in my legal career. I had a client, his name was David, David John Ross, and he was in uh, Vancouver Island Regional Correctional Center for uh, a first-degree murder charge. And, of course, that made him uh, pretty important in the jail because there's a hierarchy of prisoners there, and he was charged with a, uh, a contract killing, I guess it was. Anyway, he was in there, and one evening I went out, and the place is shut down. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. So I went back to my office, and that's when I got the phone call. Uh, it was from the, the warden of Vancouver Island Regional Correctional Center, VIRCC. He said, uh, David Ross wants to talk to you. And so on the phone comes David John Ross, and I can't figure out why he's allowed to call me. And he says, uh, hey, Doug. That's how he used to talk. Hey, Doug. We got a little problem out here. We want you to come out and negotiate. I said, "Where are you?" He said, I'm in the gym. And I said, "What's going on?" He said, "Well, uh, somebody in here. I'm not naming any names." He says, "They took a couple of guards hostage, and we want you to come and negotiate for us." And uh, of course, I knew the call was monitored. So the uh, warden came on and said, "Yeah, we uh, we've agreed that you should." Uh, if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, you can come and uh, attempt to negotiate. So uh, I thought about it. I thought, I know who's in there. They trust me. I know who's outside. I don't know if I can trust them, but if they're willing to allow me, I think I could do some good here. So I went out to the jail, and it's surrounded, and all of a sudden I'm uh, in the warden's office, and I said, well, uh, there's only one way I can deal with this, and that's if I go in and talk to him. He said, well, you can't go in there. I said, well, why not? He said, well, we can't get you out. I said, well, uh, I think it's the only way to communicate. We've got to go and talk face to face. So they said, all right. It's do, your... they, do they have guards? Uh, oh, yeah. The yeah. place is totally surrounded. Police were there. I mean, they, did the prisoners had guards that were, they had? They had two guards. Uh, one was named Waldron, and the other was McDonald. Mcdonald was the older one, and Waldron was younger. When I uh, what was their beef? What was uh, their well, I really don't know. I think it was it was uh, they wanted proper treatment for addicts. They wanted uh, to have uh, no. Uh, they wanted the hole, which was the solitary confinement cell, to be exposed because it was really horrible, and it was a uh, it was a situation. I don't know what else there really was, and what really caused it, I don't know. But I went. I wanted to find out, so I decided I would go in there. And talk to them and find out, as you just said, well, what is the problem here? So uh, they reluctantly allowed me to go in, and there was a guy by the name of Triplett, who was the deputy warden, former member of the Grenadier Guards, a British uh, guy, nice guy, uh, he's passed away now. But uh, he, um, he took me to the door of the gymnasium, and I get to the door and I look through the courtyard, and I, my feet on the courtyard uh, walkway was long hollow sound I, I remember quite well and I looked to my right and the whole place is surrounded by shotguns in the hands of policemen the whole place every 10 15 feet there were police with shotguns all around that place and I looked to my right and there's this Corporal Fahey who I had cross-examined sometime earlier and him and I were not very good friends although we became friends later on so as I got to the door Mr. Triplett opened the, the door with these great big keys, and of course, in, in, in that silence, it was deathly silent, every sound echoed through this area, and I knew they could hear that door being opened, and then I, I heard the sound of a shotgun being cocked, you know, it goes like that. Well, I thought, you bastard. <laughs> he cocked that shotgun just as I got to the door, and those people on the inside would hear that just as loud and clear as I did. And I thought, they're going to think this is a rush, and I'll be the meat in the sandwich. But <laughs> the door closed behind me. And I look around, and there's nothing but broken glass here. And I don't know, oh, where is everybody? I said, hey, hey. And from up on the second floor, down some stairs, I hear Dave say, hey, Doug, we're up here. <laughs> so we, I walk up the stairs, and here's, there's, there's probably 18 guys if you can imagine, crouched in a fetal position with their backs against the wall. And they're all like this. They're just terrified. And Dave is kind of doing the talking, because Dave's the man. I mean, Dave is the guy in there for first-degree murder, and nobody's arguing with Dave, right? So um, 
I I said, well, where's the guards? Where? What's going on? Where? Are, he says, they're in there. And I looked to my left, and here's this broken out window about uh, two feet square. And in the fa in the window appears a face, and it is the face of the biggest Indian guy I ever did see, and <laughs> that was Paul de Jarley. And uh, I immediately looked at that face into those eyes, and I thought, I am seeing Sitting Bull here. This guy had the most powerful face and the most powerful uh, look in his eyes. Absolutely fearless. And I knew I could talk to this man, and I knew that uh, as long as I had no fear, there was no reason to fear. So I felt, as I did when I took control of that plane with the one wheel falling off, a feeling of complete calm and confidence. Because, you know, you only die once. And I'm not afraid of that. So, I said, hi. And he said, hello. And uh, I said, can I come in? I went in. And there was a guy called Dennis Matthew Wilson, and he had a, a knife or a chisel, I can't remember which, right up against Waldron's throat. The two guards are tied to chairs, and there was a knife right up here. Knife or a chisel, I'm not sure which, right up at the guy's throat. I said, well, what do you want? I said, there's, there's ways we can solve this without violence, and you know the result if you don't. And I'm here to try and solve this. What's going on, and what do you want? And DeJarle did the talking, and he said, uh, I want uh, a proper treatment for addicts, no punishment except in outside court, which means, you know, you go to court, you're charged with whatever, no warden's court, and I want the media to see the whole. I, after This took quite a while, you know, and I didn't get all, I can't remember every back and forth about it, but eventually I said, well, you know what, those are probably because they don't cost them anything. Those are probably terms that they would agree to. But you gotta let me go out and explain why you want them. He says, how do I know you're gonna come back? I said, because I told you. Nobody forced me to come in here and nobody's gonna force me to come back, but I came. Why wouldn't I come back? The reason I came here in the first place was to solve this problem and I'm not gonna solve it if I don't come back. So I, you trust me or you don't trust me? He says, okay, you go. So I go outside and they take me back to the warden's office. And there's the chief of police of Saanich, Esquimalt, Victoria. They're all sitting there. And I said, here's what, you know, this is basically hot air demands. You don't have to do anything significant uh, to agree. No, we're not going to agree. I said, you're not going to agree? What is it you want? All they want is uh, the media to see the whole. No punishment except in outside court. That means they go to court. And proper treatment for addicts. Well... You know, you can agree to that. I don't know if you'll ever deliver, but you can agree to it. And uh, it took me about half an hour to tell them that this is nothing to you. It's not hurting you, and those two guards are going to be released as soon as I go back with that assurance. And I said, uh, you waste time, and this is going to get worse. Get People get tired, they get irritable, and by that time, you know, it's like 2 in the morning. I got there at about 11, and I had to talk and talk and talk and talk to get them to agree to what I just told you. And then they finally agree, and bingo, I knew that if they didn't, you know, accept those terms reasonably quickly, they're going to change. Then we get a telephone call, and it's Dave. Uh, he says, now we got a few more things we want to talk about. I thought, oh yeah, a few more things. What's that? Well, we want uh, two spikes, uh, 500 milligrams of Demerol, we want cigarettes, we want a radio. I thought, oh, here we go. This is an all-nighter now. This isn't going to be solved because, you know, when they get to Demerol, things start to change. And they're not going to be rational. What's Demerol used uh, for? It's a substitute for heroin. It's supposed to calm your nerves. I don't know what it's for. Other than usually it's a, it's a painkiller, and I, I don't know. It's like heroin. It's artificial, I think, artificial heroin. So... I said to the, the warden and all, I said, look, now we got a real problem because you guys wouldn't agree to something reasonable. Now you're going to get unreasonable demands, and I'm the guy who has to go back in there and carry those things. They said, okay, okay. I said, how much longer are you going to wait? And they said, all right, all right, you can, you can take the Demerol, the, the, the needles, the cigarettes, the radio, and go back in, and we'll agree to those terms. Well, fine, I said, because don't waste any more time. And don't change your mind, because I'm in there now. I'm a hostage now. And I said one more thing. I, when I talked to them, I said, they wanted a sign of good faith from the inmates. 
So the warden said, I want uh, one of them released. So I said, okay, uh, I'll trade myself for the older one, because the older one was McDonald. John McDonald, I'll never forget him. And uh, sure enough, they agreed. So I went in, and John McDonald went out. Now there's Waldron. There's 500 milligrams of Demerol that the police and the, the prison authorities gave me to take in, in a sterile container, and two needles, cigarettes, and a radio. So I go in. And immediately, Wilson, Dennis Matthew Wilson, was the guy who was really, I think, quite unstable. Desjarlais was the one person who kept that thing on, on the track. He did not lose his cool. And if it hadn't been for him, that thing would have deteriorated really quickly, because Wilson was a totally uh, deranged, I think, drug addict. So w Wilson gets a hold of the Demerol, immediately shoots uh, Waldron with the Demerol to test it, you see. And uh, I thought, oh, God. Anyway, Wilson gets his Demerol, and uh, they start smoking cigarettes. I said, well, we got to make this move in half an hour. I says, uh, McDonald's gone. I, uh, I'll go out with you. And, and uh, Desjardins said, I don't want to be shot out there. He says, and I'm not going unless uh, I'm handcuffed to you. And so they, uh, they sent in handcuffs. I said, we got I had a phone, and I talked to them. I said, they want handcuffs. They want me handcuffed to them. Paul, De, uh, Paul uh, Desjarlais, and they want uh, Waldron handcuffed to Wilson, and they're going to come out. The first, the 18 guys go out, and then they want the media there to cover the, uh, the surrender, so to speak. And sure enough, that's what happened. They wanted the, the media to see the hole. And that night, I was handcuffed to Desjarlais, uh, Waldron to Wilson. The 18 guys went out, and the media covered the surrender, or the, my departure from uh, the, the gym. And then they went, and they took photographs of me and uh, Desjarlais in the hole, which went in the newspaper, the Times columnist. And that was that. But they never kept their promise. They never gave proper treatment for addicts. There was punishment. They put Desjarlais and Wilson in the hole, immediately, of course. You know, if they're going to make deals... They should keep their word, because guys like me, who was in that position, will be killed because they don't trust the word in a negotiation. And if they can't negotiate in good faith, the promises they make being broken, the next time something comes up, they'll say, oh no, we want proof. You know, We don't take words, we, take, we have to have proof. Well, you can't give proof. Everything has to be based on trust. trust. And I was disappointed with the way they treated, particularly Desjarlais, because I think that guy was one... Uh, I mean, obviously, he did something wrong, very, very wrong in taking hostages. But he was also very noble in the way he dealt with it. He knew he was going to be punished. I think he died in jail eventually. And uh, I'll never forget the fact that uh, if it hadn't been for him being calm, and I think he trusted me and I trusted him, and on that basis, we resolved it. And that was a night that lasted till about 5 o'clock in the morning. And at that time, I was also um, before the Law Society on another matter. And uh, that helped, I think. That there was a lot of publicity about that. So this, the story from the media's point of view has already been told, but nobody's ever heard this side of the story, my side, when I was there. Nobody heard that before. You've heard it for the first time. So that's that.